So my county jail time was 26 months. My book oh. about that is called Hard Time because like you said, everyone who'd already been to the prison system was saying, this is hard time, county time. I'd rather do two or three days in prison than a day in here. So I was really lucky because people say, Sean, how the hell did you survive this place? You know, with these neo-Nazi gangs and all this, all this mayhem around you. Every day, heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around. Yeah. I saw a guy with his leg pointing in the completely wrong direction. Absolutely. Absolutely. No doubt about it. And I speak from experience, without a doubt. You don't want, you don't want to be in a county. I walk in redemption. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well. Everything is very good, very blessed on this end. And as always, my friends, I give God all the praise, honor, glory, and thanksgiving for that, especially through this holiday season. Very excited. Christmas coming up. We celebrate the birth of our Lord. And um, if it wasn't for, you know, God having a different plan and a purpose for my life, I wouldn't be sitting here talking to all of you. So I'm extremely thankful. I don't forget that for one day in my life that I am just blessed to be here. So uh, I know a lot of people are struggling throughout the world. Listen, we do the best with what we have and we pray for everything to turn out right. And hopefully 2024 is going to be uh, a good year and we pray for that. A uh, couple of quick reminders. Don't forget December 30th, One Socket, uh, Rhode Island, right outside of Providence. Going to be there that night, live on stage. Great tickets are really sold. We're almost sold out. I can say that for sure. Uh, we're going to have a great night. We're going to say goodbye to 2023. Welcome in 2024. Very excited about meeting with the people of Providence and Woonsocket. It's going to be a great event. Uh, January 25th, myself, Mike Tyson, Chaz Palminteri, live on the stage, the Remade Men event. And it's going to be great. We're going to do a meet and greet. You're going to hear things you've never heard from us. Three guys from New York, two from Brooklyn, one from the Bronx, but that's okay, Chaz. We let them in. Uh, and it's going to be a great night. And again, tickets are selling great. So you can go on Ticketmaster, I believe, and get tickets for that. And uh, I think that's about it for announcements. Again, I just want to wish everybody a, a happy holiday season. Hopefully you're enjoying it. And today I have a special guest, Sean Atwood, and he is a, a very notable figure. He's got a big YouTube channel, and uh, he went down on an ecstasy ring here in the United States. I interviewed him once before. I was in uh, the United Kingdom, uh, uh, not this summer, but the summer past, uh, and we did a 15-city tour, and, and Sean hosted some of the events, and he was terrific. we become good friends. He never spoke about his jail experiences, and you're going to hear some stuff today. Believe me, you're not going to want to miss this. For all you young people out there that ever think you want to be tough guys on the street, okay, you want to avoid a county jail experience. Trust me. I've had many myself. Sean is going to tell you what his experience was like. You want to avoid all of this stuff. You don't need it in your life. You know, I always say this. Life is tough enough when everything is good. You want to do the wrong thing, act like a silly person, put more baggage on your shoulders to carry around. You're going to have a very tough go at life. And before you know it, years pass and you look around, you say, what did I do with my life? Stay on track. Do the right thing, you young people. And for those of you that are middle aged, it's never too late to get yourself back in shape. I'm proof of that. You know, my life started to turn around in my mid 30s, late 30s. You know, it was a whole different experience. But here I am at 72 and the better for it. So you're going to enjoy this meeting with Sean. I am coming back to the UK. Can't wait to get there. But without getting, uh, giving too much away, let's introduce my new guest for this next sit down, Sean Atwood. Sean, great to see you again. It's been about a year and a half since we uh, were together last on the tour that I had in the UK, which was absolutely fantastic. I loved every moment of it. And uh, the good news is I'm coming back and it's going to be bigger and better. I think we're doing up to 15 cities. And the best part for me is that you're going to be hosting all 15 of them because the last time, uh, the few that you hosted, for me, they were the best. So I'm um, very excited to get back there. So uh, and thank you for, uh, you know, for coming forward on this. It's going to be great. Oh, Michael, it was a great honor to host them. Some of my best friends were sat at the table with you and they said to me afterwards, it was a night they are going to remember for the rest of their lives. So for the people of the UK, come to the tour. The tickets are on Eventbrite. There's a link in the description box below this video. And like Michael said, 15 locations, two in London, Liverpool, Manchester, Glasgow, two in Ireland, and on and on it goes. 
it's not every night you get to meet someone who is characterized in the movie Goodfellas. Well, I got to tell you, Sean, I was, uh, you know, I had visited the UK a few times uh, prior to the tour. Uh, there were short visits in and out, um, and I didn't get to spend too much time there. But this time, I was there for about six weeks. And I got to be honest, I was overwhelmed with the reception that I received from people there. They were just so warm and, and just great. I mean, we loved every minute of it. And, um, you know, taxi drivers, I walked into a taxi and, and somebody said, Mike, you don't have to pay me. Just give me a signed copy of your book. I mean, it was that great. People would... They were coming out of the pubs as I was walking down the street and pulling me in for a drink. We just had a blast. People were just absolutely wonderful. And I'm so looking forward to coming back. And, you know, I love the VIP get togethers that we have and the meet and greets and taking photos and doing all of that. So uh, and I got a few more things to talk about that uh, occurred in the last year and a half. So it's going to be uh, it's going to be a great tour. I'm looking forward to it. And I have to say this for all you people in Liverpool. We had such a great night at the cave. I'm a big Beatles guy. And I'm telling you, Sean, the cover band that was there that night, if you close your eyes, you thought it was the Beatles. It was just such a great night. And we had a great time. London was terrific. Belfast, I love. This time we're going to Dublin also. Um, Scotland was wonderful. So, I mean, I just can't wait to get back. It's going to be great. A huge thank you to Ella for asking me to host these events. And Michael, perhaps I can explain why us Brits have got a particular affinity for all things Mafia. As a young person, I remember sat on the sofa in my house watching The Godfather with my dad. And then years later, it was Casino and then Goodfellas, which you were represented in. So for us here to actually meet someone from that lifestyle, because that lifestyle, it, it, was, it never existed here. You got a lot of blowhards and thugs and hooligans <laughs> but nobody you know when they met you last time they came to me afterwards and they were saying you know all these fake hard men you meet someone like michael and he's just an absolute gentleman polite he's got the best manners but he was the real deal he doesn't need to put this act on so the responses i'm getting from the people who are aware of the tour uh, that they can't wait to see you when you come back. Well, it's going to be great and uh, really, really looking forward to it. So I think it kicks off March 16th, if I'm if not mistaken, in London. So uh, and then we go straight four or five weeks, whatever it takes us. And uh, it's going to be a great time. So looking forward to it, people. See you there soon. It's less than three months away. So uh, ready to go. And Sean, the last time you and I spoke uh, online, you know, on YouTube, um, you had had your issues here in the United States, an ecstasy ring. I know you uh, rub shoulders with my friend Sammy Gravano now. I heard a little bit about that. We talked about it. Uh, but then uh, where we left off, you were just about out of that. You weren't doing the ecstasy anymore here in the United States. You were in business. Things were moving along well. And then all of a sudden, one dark morning, there was a knock on the door very early in the morning, something I was very familiar with throughout my life. And why don't you pick it up from there? Because I know you had some, uh, um, uh, what should I say, some, some fun activity with Sheriff Joe Arpaio, who really made a name him, for himself here in Arizona. I never had the uh, pleasure, I would say, of meeting him, thank God. But you certainly had your uh, you know, activity with him. So why don't you start from there? Yeah, so we left off in part one on your channel where I had run this ecstasy ring in competition with the Gravanos. And shout out to Sammy the Bull and his son Gerard. We've just done a massive documentary that's coming out on a huge platform in America later this year that's going to blow people's minds. His crew got arrested about a year before they came for us. Now, I'd quit the importation. I thought I got away with it. It's a bit naive to the statute of limitations. I was sobered up. I was back in college studying Spanish. I was up early one morning trading the stock market. This is in Scottsdale. All of a sudden, bam, 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 knock on the door. I jump up from the computer, look through the people. It's blacked out. I hear Tempe Police Department. We've got a warrant. Open the door. I'm wondering whether it's the cops or people pretending the cops coming to rob me. So I look through the window whole complex is surrounded marksmen more boots coming up the stairs bam 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 i go through to the bedroom to my girlfriend we're like what should we do right we better let him in we walk halfway through the living room then just boom <laughs> door just flies off the hinges 
Hands above your heads. Get on the ground now. Don't effing move. The detective hoisted me up by the cuffs when I, you know, after I'd been squashed. Gets in my face and he's like, English, Sean, we finally got you. You're a big, big name from the rave scene. And later on, you know, there was thousands of pages of discovery. Uh, that was my first meeting with him face to face. But in the um, discovery, this guy had been sitting next to me in restaurants, following me around, putting trackers on my cars. He'd been trying to get me for trying to get me for years. Did uh, did Joe Arpaio actually show up at that? He was there. No, this was the the lead detective on my case oh. out of Tempe. Yeah, and he he's been interviewed as well for this documentary we've got coming out. Um, so we got um, I start screaming at my girlfriend. I'm exercising my right to remain silent. I'm exercising my right to remain silent. And they dragged me down the stairs outside, um, threw some clothes at me, put me in a police car. And I remember it's like I'm looking out of the desert. He's playing 98 KUPD hard rock. He's got the chewing tobacco and the aviator sunglasses on, <laughs> straight out of Electric Guide in Blue. And I'm thinking, my karma has finally come home. This is the consequences of my my actions. I'm about to feel them big time at that well, point. Well, you know, Sean, I want to tell you something. I, I went through that. You know, I had seven indictments. I went through that at least five times. And, you know, they always come 536 in the morning. And then I went through it three or four times as a kid with my dad. And, you know, I know you, you, you really, you know, talked about that experience. But I'll tell you how, how uh, maybe terrifying it could be. You know, my family right now, my wife, my daughter's in the house. If that uh, doorbell rings early in the morning, like 6, 6.30, it could be an Amazon driver. It could be the gardener. They won't answer the door. And this is 30 years later. They're afraid. They're saying, oh, what's going on? You know, they're afraid. That's how traumatic it was for my family members. And I'll never forget. But uh, when they do come, yeah, they come, you know, they surround the house. They come with shotguns, the, the uh, bullhorn blaring. The whole neighborhood wakes up. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really a sight. It really is. So. Yeah, my girlfriend was so terrified after that. She had to sleep at her mom's for weeks. She was traumatized. Yeah. And what happened next was they took us to Tempe Police Station. And I thought... They were just coming after me. What I didn't realize was the cops were targeting us all as a group of main co-defendants on the first day. Remember last time I told you a lot of stories about Wildman, my big maniacal friend, bodyguard who, who yes. died a couple of years ago. Um, he got arrested at the same time as well. And they were interrogating my girlfriend in Tempe police station. And he walked past and because I kept her completely separate from my illegal activity, so she didn't know anything. And they were really grilling her. And they were saying to her, you're facing serious time, serious charges. You need to tell us, you know, everything about this and that. And he kind of like broke free from the cop, shoved his head into the room and went, serious charges, my effing ass. <laughs> Don't listen to these daft. Um, I don't want to swear. But yeah, he said a lot of swear words. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a it's a harrowing experience, no doubt. So so what happens from there? Did you ever get out on bail, or did everything just start, or or what? Oh, that was just the beginning of it. I was fighting my case for almost three years, Michael. So the the, the first day, we are in Tempe Police Station, and then we go over to what was called the Horseshoe Sheriff Joe Arpaio's Jail Intake <laughs> Center. Now there's thirteen of us as the main group of co-defendants in the first raids, there ends up over a hundred of us over time. So in this bus, going to the intake, there's Wild Man and there's his girlfriend, Wild Woman, who's a mad Liverpudlian, a Scouser, as you know now. Yeah. Shout out to Scousers. So she's on the bus as well. As we arrive at the intake, you know what it's like. The new arrestees are waiting to go in. People have been tasered, been in fights with the cops. There's drunks. There's homeless people, there's gangbangers, there's people high. And there was some women in the line going in and the men were heckling them. Now, half of our co-defendants getting off the bus were women. And when Wild Woman got off, the men started, started yelling at um, expletives at the women that were our co-defendants. 
Now, Wild Man, I think I mentioned it last time, he had red dots in his head telling him to hurt people from when he was a young person. Yeah. And whenever he would commit a violent act, he would, his face would remain completely calm, but one eyebrow would go vertical. So he's watching all these fellas yell at the women with us and Wild Woman, and the women's heads are all down and they're intimidated. They're not enjoying it one bit. And I just see the eyebrow go up. So as the redneck guard is yelling at him to step down from the van to get out, he just stays on the top step. Bear in mind, Michael, when he died, he was 29 and a half stone and six foot two. So, I don't know, 400 pounds, something like that. Wow. So he's on the top step. He's been up for weeks on crack and meth. So his eyes are completely blood red. He's got a Viking's beard and he leans back and he goes, you lot disrespecting our women. I'm going to be in there with you all in a minute <laughs> and I'll have any of you. And he goes, you think I won't? And then he tilted his head back even more, widened his eyes and he just went, <laughs> <laughs> and veins were popping out of his head and they all just completely shut up right away. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great story yeah, yeah. he's a good you know, man he was a good man to get arrested with <laughs> absolutely absolutely you know and i don't think people i mean fortunately people that haven't had this experience you know getting locked up and then going through processing in a county jail uh there's nothing worse than that it's just it's just horrible uh and i obviously have done that a few times also and yeah I've seen that scene described the exact same way. And yeah, there's women, men going through. The guys, you know, half of them are derelicts who got picked off off the street. They're used to going through this process. Now, some of them enjoy it. It's unbelievable. They're going, but it's like old home week, you know, for them. But yeah, I could just imagine. It's good to have, you know, a guy like that around to put everybody in order. Yeah, and it helped a lot because in the horseshoe, it's like a horseshoe formation. Uh -huh. You go in at one side and you come out the other, but they leave in there for days. So you're in these holding cells. First, you go to a woman in a plexiglass window. She's like, have you got lice, hepatitis, AIDS, all this. She's just screaming at you. Then they strip you down, um, take your belt off, take your laces off. You go in, and in these cells, it's like subterranean. This is the Sonoran Desert, almost 50 degrees, UK temperatures, 120 summer America. You don't know what time of the day it is, except for when the heat rises, and everyone's just sat, sardine in the... Um, wall to wall people there's a toilet someone takes a crap everyone has to roll their shirts up over their faces yeah. and then you know gang bank one something crips something street gang comes in and another street and then it just kicks off on site right away and then the guards run in they drag people out and in the hallway they've got this thing it looks like a medieval torture device called a restraint chair and it's like this tilted Black, um, back, black sea, and you see people strapped in there, and they even put hoods, spit hoods over their heads, and they're, they're like this in, in, in these chairs. It's like something from Dante's Inferno. Yeah, you know, you know, Sean, it's amazing too. I was, I spent a lot of time in LA County Jail when they were trying to indict me on a thing. They took me up, took me from the feds, brought me to LA County. They had me in a hole for a while, but. Um, you know, when I used to walk through, you know, you're shackled and tied down. And they used to walk us from solitary to go out to get a visit. We used to go through the prison hospital. You would thought you were in Vietnam at the time. You, you could not believe it. And I got to tell you, Sean, I don't want to be mean, but I saw people in there. They were like aliens from another world. Like, where do these people actually live? You know, it was almost sad in a way, but they, they just... I don't know where these people are, where they find them, but what you see in a county jail, you don't see anywhere else really in society. It's unbelievable. It's, it's a tough experience, that whole thing. I spent about 11 months in the county and it was, uh, it was tough. So I, I know exactly what you're going through for sure. It's such a transitory environment. You've got people constantly coming in and out. Yeah. Nobody knows what the sentence is gonna be yet. So right. the uncertainty weighs on everybody's minds and they're all just aggressive and looking to fight each other. So after we got out of the horseshoe, I was classified medium security in the beginning, Towers Jail. Wild Man ended up over there as well, but he was sent to a different tower. So as soon as they got to that jail, that's when the lower level of the Aryan Brotherhood people come up to you, the skinheads, with the swastikas and Hitler and all this Nazi stuff on them. And they're like, hey, Wood. We want a word with you, get in that cell over there. 
And you know you can't say no, or this is just going to smash your head into the wall. So I go into the cell. They come in behind me, close the door so it's almost closed. Biggest one gets in my face. He's like, what are your charges? What are your charges? Now, I've read it. It's like continuous criminal enterprise, conspiracy, leading a crime syndicate. I have no idea what any of this means. I'm new to this. So I yeah. say to them, I don't know what my charges mean. This is not a good answer. Now yeah. they've got me against the wall about to attack me. What do you mean you don't know what your charges mean? Are you a chomo? Are you a chomo? I didn't even know oh. what a chomo was at that point. Didn't even know. They couldn't tell from your accent that you weren't a cholo? <laughs> <laughs> In the end, they make you pull out your charge sheet. So they read my charge sheet and they immediately calmed down. They saw my bail bond was $750,000 cash only. And they respected that. They were like, damn, who did you guys kill? And I'm uh -huh. like, no, we were, just, we were just throwing raves, ecstasy. We didn't kill anybody. It was all very chilled out. Then they explain all the rules I must follow or else the whole gang will attack me. If someone calls me a punk, a bitch, or hits me, I must fight them on the spot or else the whole gang will attack me. I must take showers or they'll attack me for bad hygiene. Can't go making friends with the guards, they'll attack me for snitching. Can't sit at the tables with other races, they'll attack me for that. And on and on and on and on and on it goes. And I later learn they're constantly looking for people to attack because that's how they earn their tattoos yeah. and rise up in the gang. It's called putting in work to earn your political ink. And to be a full member of the Aryan Brotherhood, you got to murder someone for them in the jail. Yeah, no. I'll tell you, you know, in L.A. County, how bad it was. There was guys that were in there, and half of them don't understand their charges. They, you know, they have a public defender that really doesn't care what's going on with them. They appear because they have to appear. They don't even understand the charges against them. And after spending months and months and months not knowing what their outcome is, they want to get out of the county so bad because it's such a cesspool. They start stabbing people so that they can get charged and go to the prison. You know, I know when I was up in a law library and they don't know who you are. You could be mafia. These people have no clue, right? They have no clue. I had to, when I was on the phone with the attorney, I had a phone book on me, you know, in my chest. So that in case somebody came up behind me when I wasn't looking, they'd stab the phone book instead. I mean, it got that bad in there. County jails in, in America, I don't know how they are in the rest of the world. I guess they could be even worse. But here, man, no fun whatsoever. So what happened? How long did you spend in the county? So my county jail time was 26 months. My book about that is called Hard Time because like you said, everyone who'd already been to the prison system was saying, this is hard time, county time. Yeah. I'd rather do two or three days in prison than a day in here. Absolutely, absolutely, no doubt about it. And I speak from experience, without a doubt. You don't want, you don't want to be in a county. Yeah, so I was working out with a La Victoria gang member, a Chicano. This is in the, the earlier weeks. And the neo-Nazis, they come out the door and they're like nodding at me and they're like, we want a word with you, Wood. And mm -hmm. I look at the, the sniper, his name was, he's like, yeah, go talk to your people. So I go, I go and talk to the, these AB guys and they're like, take a look around the day room, Wood. And I'm like, yep. Do you see any of the white boys working out with the other races? Mm -hmm. I'm like, nope. You've got a lot to learn, Wood. Now go finish your workout. Wow. So it's like you got the gang rules, you got the guard rules. It's all in conflict, and you got to get through it somehow. Let me ask you: Were they intrigued? You know, because you were a Brit. You know that. Uh, how did that sit well with them or not? You know, at the time. Michael, I I played the Brit card to the max. Yeah. Everything that was British that had gone viral on American TV, Monty Python's Flying Circus, Clockwork Orange, they were asking me questions about it. But a big thing that helped me was that even though Wild Man was in a different tower from me, he quickly established a name for being a maniac. And I would see him when I went to the Catholic Mass or one of the church services. Now, there came a point where the Italian Mafia took over our building from the Aryan Brotherhood. Mm -hmm. And they asked me, who did I want in my cell? They couldn't move Wildman in because he had a do not house. The prosecutor didn't want us together. Right. But in the second, the second group of co-defendants, they didn't have a do not house. So I put these guys in me and one of them, he's dead as well. His name's Joey Crack. So every night these Italian mafia dudes would come in and Joey Crack's telling them stories about Wildman and they just sat there mesmerized. So they arranged to meet him at Catholic Mass. 
Now, this is how tight they had it before I tell you the Catholic Mass story. The head of the Italian Mafia guys, we'd all be locked down at night. He'd be outside smoking with the guards, giving them orders. When we had shakedowns, he would have the next staff that he corrupted bring us all our stuff back, and we knew the shakedowns were coming in advance. He had wow. his girlfriend come in as a lawyer, and he was getting legal visits, unsupervised, yeah. and having sexual relations with her. Do you remember who he was? I'm not going to say, because he okay. is in Supermax prison right now. Oh, he is? Okay. He, yeah, he was on a short sentence back then, and um, we shared the same lawyer, Alan Simpson, uh -huh. and I knew when those guys invited me to start working out with them, I was in with a good crew, and we, we really say, got along. But yeah, one, you made the... You made the I, right I, did relationship. A, I did a Locked Up Abroad episode, right? I don't know if you've ever seen him on National Geographic. And two or three years ago, Bruno, who was an enforcer for Little Italy, that's what we called him, in Sheriff Joe Arpaio's jail, he saw it and he contacted me. And I've interviewed him several times on my channel now. He's from uh, New York and all that stuff. And um, he was like, yeah, we, I was asking about Wildman. He's like, yeah, everyone, you know, had a lot of respect for Wildman. He was a maniac. He was a one-man machine. He was just so unpredictable. So I was really lucky because people say, Sean, how the hell did you survive this place? You know, with these neo-Nazi gangs and all this, all this mayhem around you. Every day, heads getting bashed against toilets, bodies getting thrown around. Yeah. Saw a guy with his leg pointing in the completely wrong direction. Um, and it was because Wildman was in there with me. So we go to Catholic Mass and Bruno sat on one side, we're on the back row, Wildman sat on the other. They meet for the first time. They shake hands so powerfully. I'm in the middle. I almost fly out of my seat. <laughs> now, now, what happened was the, um, the priest, he was giving a sermon and he started, um, you know, telling everybody that his, that his mom was seriously ill and she was very old. And um, half, of, half the people in there were crying. It was really sad. Yeah. But um, I, I saw the power of the Italian mafia basically extend into the jail system with my own eyes. I thought that stuff only happened in the movies, Michael, until yeah. I saw it with my own eyes. Yeah, we, we knew how to move around during that time uh, for some reason, you know? And uh, listen, you know, I, ask, I get asked all the time, you know, the scene in Goodfellas when Henry Hill and Paulie were in there and they were getting, I said, look, it's not quite that good, but we had it, we had it okay. I, we had it better than the rest, let's put it that way.